the desire to write is something that's been quite elusive for me. I haven't been able to to ever sort of put my finger on the thought that begins it when I begin writing something. It's always a feeling and never really an idea or a thought at the beginning. And when I sat down to write Shuggy Bane, actually I wouldn't allow myself to imagine it being something larger, something that would eventually become a book, because I found that far too intimidating. And so it was just a compulsion to come to the page and to write as the writing came to me. And so the first draft was actually incredibly chaotic. It lacked a discipline in many ways, and if it would have been published, it would have made a 1600 page book. But I found when I started writing, I couldn't stop. Um, and I also found that I didn't want to stop, that I, there was a catharsis to it that I wanted to really just get to know these characters very deeply. Even if I was writing about things that ultimately wouldn't make it to the final book, uh, it was important for me to grow my understanding of them. And so I wrote what I felt, I wrote what I saw, but it didn't ever come from an initial thought, which I think surprises a lot of people because the book, as well as being quite intimate and quite political, covers, covers quite a lot of things, but it really started with a feeling. You know, a lot of it was about love and about loss and about grief. Um, the book is absolutely a work of fiction, but I do write about a lot of themes that have parallels to my own life. I grew up as poor as Shuggy. I was raised on government benefits because my father abandoned the family and my mother uh, was suffering with mental health issues. And so um, we really relied on the state. Uh, I was the youngest son of a single mother who suffered with alcoholism from my earliest childhood memory up until she died one day when I was at school, when uh, I was 16. Um, I was a young queer man in a very masculine place under a patriarchy. And so those are the ways that my own story mirrors or the themes of it sort of, I write from the inside. Um, and, you know, that was really a lot of the feelings I was trying to express. When I talk about love and loss and grief, when I lost my mother at 16, I was reeling for most of my adult life. I'm now 44, I'm still not over it. It was such a sudden loss that also felt so incredibly wasteful, you know? Um, and I think because you don't have agency as a child or you don't have as much agency, um, now as a man, I would do anything to be able to reach back through time and use all the resources I have as an adult and just scoop my mother up. And so you can't do that, but that can Compulsion, <clears throat> excuse me, that compulsion brought me to the page to really, um, to memorialize my mother, not just her struggles, but also all of her wonderful charm, her defiance, her pride, her wit, um, her absolute belief in herself, the idea that she was the star of her own movie, even if the landscape behind her was incredibly gray. And so, you know, it was, there's an awful lot of um, the resilience of the characters in the book comes from my own mother, although my own mother is not in the book. And so it was a lot of these feelings. It was love and it was loss and it was grief. Certainly writing the book for me, you know, as a, as a working class man from the west coast of Scotland, we're, we're never encouraged to talk about our feelings or our trauma or our vulnerability or our hurt. Um, and so in a lot of ways, I just carried a lot of the memories and the socioeconomic times inside of me with, with no one to really share it with. Um, and so I was incredibly fortunate that I had art take some quite ugly things and try and make things beautiful out of them. But also as a human being before I'm a writer to help me process some of the things that uh, perhaps I'd lived through or I'd seen. One of the reasons why the book took 10 years to write was, first of all, because I was learning my craft as a writer. I, I don't come from an MFA. I, didn't then have a circle of writer friends, but also because I had to deepen my empathy um, as a human being and also as a writer. I understood certainly what things felt like to the central character of Shuggy if he was being bullied or he was suffering with a parent with addiction. But I didn't, when I began, have the understanding of why would a woman turn her back on her children and turn to alcoholism? Why were men allowed to uh, live without consequence, to leave their families? You know, why was the social backdrop the way it was? And, and so I had to go back and really sit with that, which um, was very useful for me as a writer, but also useful for me as a human being, trying to understand things that I was too young to understand at the time. Uh, you know, you're right when you are... When we talk about children not having agency within a situation where a parent has addiction, it doesn't then stop the child trying to have agency. One of the, the strangest, one of the most perverse things about loving a parent who's suffering with addiction is the role of caregiver and child 
inverts, it flips um, instantly. And you know, the wonderful thing about children in perhaps a functional family is they're the center of their own universe, but then they become the center of everyone else's universe. But when you're a child who's suffering with a parent with addiction, that parent is the center of the universe because all of the care and concern very quickly has to turn to them. Are they going to be okay? Are their emotional needs going to be met? Are we going to have trouble later in the day? You know, we have a good Tuesday, but is Wednesday going to be terrible? And as a child, you learn that very, very quickly. So you never have that sense of yourself as the center of things. You, it's always the parent who is struggling. But even though you don't have agency as a child, you try so hard. You think if you're going to be, if you can be quieter, if you can be brighter, if you can be funnier, if you can distract the parent, if you can keep the house clean, anything, you know, that would alter their behavior and perhaps make them not want to turn to drink. And that's a lot of the tr the trauma that Shuggy goes through in the book. You know, it's a lot of the behavior. He's always reading the weather as it comes into the room. And he's always wondering what is today going to hold? There's some scenes in the book where he just stands outside of the house and he's looking to see are are the lights on is someone in the kitchen you know all these small telltale signs can I hear music um, to give him clues as to what he's going to face when he comes home from school and part of that is also the the trauma of alcoholism because sometimes when people drink you never quite know what type of alcoholic you're going to get. Sometimes they drink for a good time. Sometimes they drink to express sadness, grief to, you know, to escape. And, and that also is uh, almost a form of terrorism for the person that loves them because you never know. Certainly as a child, being very watchful of others felt like a huge burden. Um, but I think as I became an adult and as I became a writer, I was very grateful of those powers of observation and the ability to tune into someone else's emotional well-being is really helpful as a writer. I mean, I think we're all trying to achieve that. So in a way, um, my childhood has, has helped me with my art. I often also think about as a young boy, as who's the son of a single mother, I was often exposed to this inner sanctum of women that young boys often don't get to see. My mother couldn't afford a babysitter, so I just orbited her like a minor moon, no matter where she was, no matter what she did. And at times that was just being around other mothers and sort of dissecting what was going on in the world. But there was also a subculture of women who were all suffering with addiction that I got to see as a child. And as a young boy, I thought, oh, why am I here? You know, I don't want to be here. But then as an adult and as a writer, I think actually, although perhaps it's not an experience I would have wished for as a child, I'm incredibly lucky to have seen the inner world of that. Um, and I draw on that a lot when I'm creating the female characters in my work and, and when I think about my mother. And actually, one of the real reasons for writing Shuggy Bain it wasn't a fully formed thought at the beginning, but I was aware of the literary tradition in the United Kingdom of working class books. We think about James Kelman, we think about Irvin Welsh of um, Alan Stilto. We think about industrial revolution or upheaval, but it's often told from a, from a man's point of view. Um, and whether the man then goes drinking and carousing and gets into violence and trouble, it's a very masculine sort of form. And Although that was happening all around me, I always knew the strength and the power and the expression and the real way to interpret the world was, was really in this feminine bubble inside it. And so in writing Shuggy Bane, I almost wanted to exclude men in a way and really focus on the feminine. And whether that's Agnes, who's a single mother, or Shuggy, who's a young queer boy, uh, at the heart of it, I wanted to keep the focus on the, on the feminine. But I realized that actually my 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 passion and my desire for short story writing did come from my mother, um, or for writing in general, in fact. Um, but also, funnily enough, I spent most of my career actually as a knitwear designer, and it was my mother that also taught me how to knit. And we were in this very weird um, relationship as a child and his mother, because my mother taught me to knit as a child because it occupied me. I was a lonely kid. I was, I always wanted to be around my mother because I was worried about her frequently. Um, and so she taught me how to knit to sort of occupy me and get, get a little bit of distance. But at the same time, we entered, when I was about seven or eight, we entered into this practice of, uh, when my mother was drinking, she wanted to tell someone a story. She wanted someone to listen to her. Sometimes the thing people crave most is an audience. And so I would sit at her feet and in a school book, she would dictate stories to me. And we would begin what almost would be her memoir. 
Uh, one of the things about that I drew on for the character of Agnes Bain in the book is she's fascinated with Elizabeth Taylor. Because Elizabeth Taylor here is, first of all, a very talented, beautiful film star. But she's also quite a difficult woman. You know, she was unlucky in love. She had addiction problems of her own. And whenever she played a character in a movie, it was never, a, you know, it was very, never a obedient, kind sort of woman. She was always disrupting something. She was always willful. She was badly behaved. And my mother saw a kindred soul in that. And, and so she was also that same sort of woman. But we punish working class women in Glasgow for that kind of behavior where we celebrate Elizabeth Taylor. And so when I'm seven or eight, I realize a strategy to sort of hold my mother's attention on me and also to uh, keep her away from drinking, really to keep her focused and thinking about different things, was to take her memoir and to begin writing that. We never really got further than a page or two, but it always, always started with a dedication to Elizabeth Taylor. And Elizabeth, it always said, Elizabeth Taylor, who knows nothing about love, which is such an aggressive way to start any book, to tell someone else what they do and they do not know but also for this, you know, housewife on the East End of Glasgow to talk to this Hollywood film star. And that really stuck with me. Um, so I suppose that's really where my first uh, writing commission began um, as a kid. Agnes Bain pushed her toes into the carpet and leaned out as far as she could into the night air. The damp wind kissed her flushed neck and pushed down inside her dress. It felt like a stranger's hand, a sign of living, a reminder of life. With a flick, she watched her cigarette doubt fall, the glowing embers dancing sixteen floors down onto the dark forecourt below. She wanted to show the city this claret velvet dress. She wanted to feel a little envy from strangers, to dance with men who held her proud and close. But mostly, she wanted to take a good drink, to live a little. With a stretch of her calves, she leaned her hip bone on the window frame and let go of the ballast of her toes. Her body tipped down towards the amber city lights and her cheeks flushed with blood. She reached her arms out to the lights and for a brief moment she was flying. No one noticed the flying woman. She thought about tilting further then, dared herself to do it. How easy it would be to kid herself that she was flying until it became only falling and she broke herself on the concrete below. The high-rise flat she still shared with her mother and father pressed in against her. Everything in the room behind her felt so small, so low ceilinged and stifling, payday to mass day, a life bought on tick, with nothing that ever felt owned outright. To be 39 and have her husband and her three children all crammed together in her mammy's flat gave her a feeling of failure. Him, her man, who when he shared her bed now seemed to lie on the very edge, made her feel angry with the littered promises of better things. Agnes wanted to put her foot through it all, or to scrape it back like it was spoilt wallpaper, to get her nail under it, and to rip it all away. Funnily enough, I grew up in a house uh, where we didn't have any books. I think we had one copy of Flowers in the Attic, and, you know, I don't know that anyone ever necessarily read it. But not having books at home wasn't an unusual thing for the time or the place. I can't remember any of the other boys having books. We were just, that wasn't where we were as a community. It didn't make us any less curious or empathetic. Uh, and we just didn't have books. Books were expensive. We didn't see ourselves in literature. We didn't turn to it. And so really, I only discover the power of books at about 17 after my mother has died. Um, and I can actually suddenly focus on school. And by then, I mean, I'm just blown away. Thomas Hardy was one of the first writers I ever read. It's very standard for the British curriculum. But for me, you know, who had never really been outside of the housing estate he lived in, to both travel in place and in time just blew my mind. Um, but by that point, it's too late for me to think about English and academia as something I want to do. There's already, there's almost a blind spot there for working class kids. It feels like a very middle class pursuit. Um, but also my schooling had been so disrupted, so I wouldn't have been great at it. And so instead, I'm encouraged, which was a wonderful encouragement by my teachers, into textiles, which is a very practical, pragmatic Scottish trade. What do we make if not whiskey? We make cloth. You know, it's, it's highly employable. And at the tail end of the Thatcher years, you need to be employed. Um, but I've harbored, after a, a lifetime sort of working in textiles, I really, you know, I had to let my inner writer out. And so I began Shuggy Bain at the height of my fashion career in New York in 2008. And I worked on it for 10, 12 years and I didn't tell anybody. I just wrote because I had to write. I didn't have any 
need to have it be published. I didn't think it ever would be published. It would be good enough to be published. Um, but it was enough for me to just have the, just to be able to write. Between uh, embarking on a textiles career and starting Shuggy Bane, there were some very sparse short stories, but nothing of real uh, effect or nothing that, of a body of work. And so my writing was never... Um, was never something I could actually get to a lot. Even in writing Shaggy Bay and working in fashion in New York was a 14 hour day. Some days it was 16 hours a day. It was an incredibly demanding career. And so I had to steal time, 30 minutes in the morning. Maybe I would have some hours on a Sunday. I used to love long haul flights. They used to send me to Asia a lot to visit factories. And that was 16 hours where no one could reach me. And so you take a writer's retreat wherever you can get it. And I would just spend my time flying um, and writing. And one of the things that I had to learn is, is I think everyone writes books differently. I had to spend a lot of time writing the book, but not at a desk. So I would write in sketchbooks, I would write in scrapbooks, I would write on my phone. Um, and when I got to my desk is when it could be four or five weeks until I could really sit down and have a proper chunk of writing. But what I realized is I was always carrying the characters in my head. And so I was changing dialogue. I was thinking about sentences. I was, you know, talking to them when I was in a room by myself, even when I was on the subway. And that in its own form is a form of writing. You're always working with the work. And so it was just about doing it when I could. Right, the story I think is so close to my own heart. Um, and so when I sat down to a desk, it suddenly came back to me instantly. And I could hear the voices, I could hear the characters because I'd been carrying them with me all that time. Um, I just had to make time to write. The process of publishing the book for me was, uh, was really quite strange, I think. I, Shuggy had gone for 10 years of my life as being this sort of light that was drawing me towards it. I couldn't wait to get back to the page. I couldn't, I had this career in fashion, but I couldn't wait to return to my novel. But then about the 10 year mark, I realized I'm fiddling and I'm just working on uh, drafts. And it went from being a sail that was pulling me through my life to being an anchor. I couldn't move beyond it. I couldn't write the next thing. And so I didn't know that I wanted Shuggy to be published, but I about the 10 year mark, I realized I have to give these characters away in order creatively to move beyond them um, and to write about other characters. And so I sent the book out uh, to find an agent and that took about six months to a year. I was rejected many times. I was really fortunate to be accepted by an agent I really admired. Um, but then my agent worked with me on the book and we edited it uh, a little bit, not too much. And then she sent it out for submission. And Shuggy, received very quickly 20 uh, rejections. She actually told me it was 20. It was actually 44. She just saw how dejected I was that she stopped telling me after 20. Um, and actually for any debut novelist, your agent might ask you when she sends out your book for submission, do you want to know when you get rejected? And of course, being naive, I was like, yes, I want to know. It'll make me a better writer. And my advice to you would be is you don't want to know until you're accepted. Um, because it's a hard process and, you know, rejection's part of a writer's life. I'm, I'm still being rejected with my next work, with my short stories. Um, but you, you know, you have to believe in your work. A lot of the rejection that came for Shuggy is people didn't, publishers didn't know how to connect it with the readership. Who knew about Glasgow? Who cared about Thatcherism? Who, how could you sort of connect all of these things? And, um, but I believe so much in the story that I, I didn't revise anything and I just kept going. And the truth is, is rejection is really important for a writer too, because what you don't want is you don't want to find a publisher that feels very ambivalent about your work or lukewarm, because actually publishing your book is just the beginning of a journey. It's a very hard thing to be an author, to have your work out there in the world. It's very competitive. And so you really want an editor in a publishing house that believes in you and will stand behind you. And so rejection is just the journey to find your champion in that way. Um, and I remember going into Grove Atlantic in New York after having 20, I thought, but 44 rejections. And they just said, we have to publish this book. We don't know how we're going to publish it, but we must publish it. And that was just transformative for me. Um, when I received that, I actually quit my career in fashion, a 22 year career in fashion, because I've been waiting so long for that moment to, to feel validated as a writer, to feel like my work was there. And, um, and it was just really wonderful. And then to go into the actually editing process, because it had been such a personal project for 10 years, 
I actually couldn't work with an editor as a debut novelist. I couldn't receive the feedback in a lot of ways. And when you first get your edits, uh, you know, there are things that are marked out. There are things we could cut this, we could lose this, especially for quite a long book, like 450 pages. And I actually balked at most of it. I couldn't. No, I refused it. And my editor just said to me, he saw that I wasn't going to take a lot of the feedback. And he said to me, you know, all I want to do is keep the lens on Shuggy and Agnes together. I want to really just focus on them. And after having worked on this manuscript, that was one sentence he gave me. And I still rejected a lot of his edits, but I was able to find my own. I was able to say, okay, that's a good, that's a noble cause. That will be something that will make the book stronger. And so then I went through and I found, I found my own edits. One of the things that I think surprises a lot of people is over the 10 years of working on the book, over the 16 hundred page draft that then became a 400 page book, the story didn't change. Um, you know, the plot arc didn't change the characters and their motivations. What really happened was a process of distillation and the book got tighter and more focused and we got rid of things. I got rid of things that were just not necessary. Um, but even then working with an editor to take it from a 500 page book to a 450 page book felt brutal, felt really <laughs> like a, like an intrusion, but, but we got there. I, I, you know, I didn't find the editing of the book a difficult process. I, f I found that I very quickly trusted my editor and I was incredibly grateful um, to finally, after 10 years of working on this by myself, to have someone else who'd read it and who wanted to collaborate with me on it. And so I trusted him immensely. What I found strange is when you come from a career in fashion, fashion is all about collaboration. You cannot make something by yourself. You need pattern makers. You need people in the atelier or the factory making it. You need models. You you need marketers. It's, it's instantly about fashion. And what I had always enjoyed about my writing was the isolation, the creative isolation. And so I think I just rejected it a little bit um, because suddenly here I was again in a position of collaboration and I was almost rebelling against that because my, my other career was all about um, collaboration. So it was just uh, about shifting gears, I think, but, but we got there eventually. And my, my editor is fantastic. He's a very um, talented, well-read young editor. I think he's in his early 30s. Um, and I'm very proud to say that I share him with Bernadine Evaristo, who won the Booker the year before, and also uh, Viet Nguyen, who, uh, who won the Pulitzer for The Sympathizer. So I knew I was in good hands with, with Peter Blackstock. Do you have uh, other people to read? I mean, your husband had read your novel as the first person, I think. That was a really important relationship for me. Uh, to understand my husband's American, I'm Scottish. Um, we've been together now for 25 years, but about 15 years into our marriage, he begins to read Shuggy Bain about 14 years in. Um, and now my husband's been home to Glasgow. He's seen my family. He obviously understands that I didn't know my father. My mother died when I was a child. But there was something for him when he read Shuggy Bain that allowed him to fully comprehend the world in a way that just visiting it and seeing it, he hadn't been able to absorb it. And I think that's the power of literature, your ability to really put your your feet in someone else's shoes and to, and to step into the room. And, you know, Shuggy is a book that I wanted to make as textural as possible. If, if people were going to spend time with Agnes and Shuggy, then I was going to make sure I gave the characters the dignity of details. And I was going to ask the reader to be immersed in that world. Because for many readers, it would be like visiting another planet. They wouldn't understand Thatcher's Britain. They might not know Glasgow. And I knew that I had to really take care and take time with the reader in that way. And for my husband, as my first reader, suddenly it revealed things about me that he hadn't known even 14 years into a relationship. He just couldn't project himself there as this middle-class boy from uh, New England. The song changed and Shuggy kept dancing. It was a self-conscious shimmy now. His hands burst open like fireworks and his head flicked as if he had long sexy hair. He dipped and popped, using his hips too much for a boy. He emoted along with the song like it was a grand opera, not a three-bar pop factory hit written for 13-year-old girls. Brilliant, what a smooth mover, she said. I'm gonna do all this up the dancing next week. Eugene will just die, just you wait. He was enjoying her attention. Something inside him flowered and he started popping his body like he'd seen the black boys on telly do. The self-consciousness left him and he spun and shimmied and shook in all the telly ways. He was mid-cat sleep when he let out a sharp scream. 
It was high-pitched and womanly, the same shriek he let loose when Leek leapt out of the dark at him. Shuggy stood with his fingers outstretched, frozen in time. He hadn't seen them at first, and he would never know how long they had been there, but across the street, in the window of the front room, stood the Macavenies. They pressed against the large glass window, and they were gutting themselves with laughter. The window throbbed as they beat their hands against it with glee, and Dirty Mouse did a little sexy girlish pirouette, and Shuggy realised that was him. He looked up at his mother. When had she noticed? She only looked down at him and took a draw on her fag. Without looking out the window, she spoke through clenched teeth. If I were you, I would keep dancing. I can't. The tears were coming. You know they only win if you let them. I can't. His arms and fingers were still outstretched and frozen like a dead tree. Don't give them satisfaction. Mammy, help. I can't. Yes, you can. She was still smiling through her teeth. Just hold your head up high and gee at Laldi. She was no use at maths homework, and some days you could starve rather than get a hot meal from her. But Shuggy looked at her now and understood that this was where she excelled. Every day, with the makeup on and the hair done, she climbed out of her grave and held her head high. When she had disgraced herself with drink, she got up the next day, put on her best coat and faced the world. When her belly was empty and her wains were hungry, she did her hair and let the world think otherwise. I think I'm inspired by many different things. And I think when I look across all of my work, what unites it is I'm always thinking about queerness from a working class point of view. I think that's a very underserved place in literature. Often when we read about queer characters, it's from a middle class or an upper middle class. I think about how formative, uh, you know, Maurice and E.M. Forster or even Giovanni's room was for me, but it didn't necessarily come from the same socioeconomic background that, that I write from. And so in a lot of ways, I write about tender souls in very hard places. I'm always striving to get to um, the bottom of what makes a family and where do you find your sense of belonging. And when you don't conform in a very small place or, or you can't fit in in terms of masculinity or femininity, how do you get by? How do you survive? Um, and so my next novel, although it's a very different book from Shuggy Bain, it's a much more propulsive plot driven book. It deals with uh, sexuality in a very different way than Shuggy does. It's still really about people who feel themselves excluded from the patriarchy or who are trying to manage and trying to get through. Uh, and yet, you know, they're just not coming up to, to level with it and people around them can see it. I'm always fascinated by a sense of otherness and, and otherness doesn't have to be about queerness because Agnes's otherness comes from her sense of refined manners and her projecting this sense of pride and she's isolated for this very thin veneer of of vanity uh, almost as as what she has in the book and and she's othered very quickly within her community so i'm always interested in those people that are just outside of center and feel the chill of that I think being an outsider is often a great place for a writer to start. I think um, it often gives us a perspective that perhaps other people don't have, but it allows us to look back on situations and look at what we're being <laughs> excluded from with slightly more of a clear eye. Uh, funnily enough, I think part of the compulsion to write Shuggy Bane was about bringing myself home. As a young queer man in Glasgow in the 80s, I was excluded to the point of invisibility. You know, the culture just didn't see me. And when it did see me, it was through mockery and through bullying. You know, homophobia had lots of different frequencies. It could be very casual, seemed like banter. It could be incredibly violent. But either way, I was there was no place for me in my hometown. And so in a lot of ways, I'm answering a silence with Shuggy Bain, both on Agnes's behalf, but also on Shuggy's behalf. And just saying we were always here, even though you didn't see us. And returning both our characters or, or the type of people we are to the literary tradition, but also to the city itself. You know, it's a very masculine city. It's always focused on the working male. And when you're a young queer man, you get excluded. And so Shuggy's about bringing myself home. I'm sometimes asked um, if I left Glasgow because obviously I've lived now 22 years in New York. And the truth is, is I never meant to leave my hometown. I was just never allowed to feel like I belonged. Um, and 
you know, it was Glasgow didn't have a place for me, not in the 80s, not under Thatcher in Section 28, not when you're working class. Now, it's an incredibly cosmopolitan city. Um, there's a very vibrant gay community. There always was. But when you're poor in any city and you're queer, you can sometimes not feel access to that. You know, it's an awful lot to be able to go to the neighborhoods where the gay bars are or to access pubs. And when you can't get off of, you know, the four streets that you live upon. And so in a lot of ways, Shuggy is a homecoming for me. It's about really uh, knitting myself into the, the history of the, of the city and knitting characters like Shuggy into it. Shuggy Bane is definitely a love story to Glasgow. It's, but like all love stories or all love letters, it can be quite complicated. You know, part of the, the reason why I wanted to write the book was to celebrate the Glaswegian spirit, but it's a very conflicting spirit. It can be incredibly tender, it can be violent, it can be sad, and then the funniest thing you've ever seen. And um, there's a lot of humanity in Glaswegians that I really like to try and capture. There's a lot of contradictions in that humanity. And so for me, I, you know, Glasgow's a character in the book. And that's why I think it's almost a love story to the city. But Glaswegians would never stand to have a book that was just about flattery or just about talking about uh, the wonderful sides of the city, because not all of it was wonderful. Not all of our history was uh, peaceful and prosperous. And so it's important to be incredibly honest, because I think the book would never have passed the Glaswegian test if it had just been talking about lovely, nice things. So... It was important to be honest. I actually didn't set out to write a political book, although publishing the novel has taught me how political it is. I actually set out to write a love story. Um, it's an incredibly intimate story um, uh, between a mother and her children, and they're, they're doing their very best and they're loving and supporting each other. And that's all I really wanted to do. Um, it's about love in many ways, because it's not only about love between a mother and her son, but it's also about a woman's quest for love. She's jilted by her husband at the beginning, and then she searches for love through the, the latter half of the book. But I don't think you can set a novel in 1980s Glasgow uh, that, and not have it be political because it was such a time of upheaval in the city. Thatcher's policies took unemployment to about 26%. It stayed there for a very long time. There was life expectancy uh, attrition. Uh, you know, life expectancy for working class men dropped about 11 years in the East End. And we know that drink and drugs and addiction swept into the city, that when hope goes, uh, really murky things come in to replace it. Um, and so the book becomes incredibly political in that way. But the political is uh, a very intimate politics, because I think if I'd written a book about men, it would have been about picket lines, it would have been about protest, it would have been really on the social end of it. But because it's about how men struggle, but really how women and children suffer when men struggle, then the politics happens on the body. It not only happens on Agnes's body, it happens on Shuggy's body. It happens on how they care for each other through tough times, whether that's they're hungry at times, whether that's they're getting dressed out to go out on the town, uh, or whether that's through addiction. And so the political is really personal. And funnily enough, because I didn't have any concept of readers, then I was freed to write everything from the character's perspective. Not only uh, to tell the honesty of the situation, but also to use language in a way that supports them. A lot of the book in English is actually written using a Glaswegian dialect or written in broad Scots. And language plays a really important role in the book, as does clothing, as does a lot of different things, because Agnes, the main character of the book, rejects the the native tongue of her neighbors and her family and the people around her. And she speaks almost like a newscaster. She has this projected accent, which is because she is a product of a class system in the UK that tells you that regional accents are wrong and that we should all speak like the queen and we should all aspire to, to rise to the middle class. And Agnes falls for it or she's, she's affected by that. Um, but language in that way actually increases her isolation because the people around her see her and think, who does she think she is? You know, why is she talking like that? And then, of course, human nature follows because when you see someone projecting airs and graces, you then very quickly want to sort of pull at them and say, why do you think you're so special? And so it's all a bit of a pride and shame as a little bit of a trap for Agnes. But clothing also plays a really important role. You know, one of the cliches I find in working class uh, let's call it media, whether that's cinema or, or literature, is sometimes we think when people are poor that it can be a bit grubby or it can be a bit dirty. And I never knew that. I always knew the, the actual opposite of that. You know, growing up, the mothers around me would never allow their kids to go over the door without looking immaculate. And that was, you might not be able to afford many clothes, but you were always 
cleaner than a whistle. Um, and it was saying the truth about the house. And there was an awful lot of pride in that. And sometimes as a kid, it was annoying because your mother was always at you to sort of tidy yourself up. But she was she was trying to project something to the world. She was trying to hide, um, you know, maybe the hunger or the fact we couldn't pay our bills or that there was trouble at home. And I wanted to play on that with the book. I wanted to really make Agnes the archetype of that type of character because she is a woman who, no matter what happens to her, will never go over the front door without looking like a film star, without looking her very best. And it, it bristles a lot of the other women around her. It causes some problems for her. But I think working class pride is um, is really a superpower. You know, one of the joys of writing the book was to really embrace the Glaswegian dialect and idioms and turns of phrase. And I can't always take credit for it because some of it just comes naturally from the people. Um, but it's such an expressive language and it can be very contradictory. Even when you declare love for someone, you fucking love them. You know, it's a very intense sort of thing. And there's violence within tenderness there. And there's, there's just the unexpected. I think there's a poetry to how people can fold metaphors into their language and it's incredibly descriptive. It can be incredibly cutting. It can be really evocative, but just allowing the characters to say things that Glaswegians would normally say um, was a, re a real joy. And I think brings a lot of humor to the book, which I think is important too, because that's one of the things about the Glaswegian spirits is no matter how difficult things are, you know, we always try to embrace things with humor. There's actually a, a phrase in Scotland that says, you'll have more fun at a Glaswegian funeral Funeral than you would at an Edinburgh wedding. And that, that talks a lot about the spirit of the people, you know, even in tough times, um, we can have a laugh. But one of the things about using broad Glaswegian in a book and, and uh, broad Scots and inflecting a book with that is it was a nightmare, I think, for translators. I think it was very difficult. Um, and even translating it into Danish was such a um, a learning experience for me because there are turns of phrases that we just accept or we grow up with or we understand and no one reads your work as closely as a translator. And so dissecting it and taking them through uh, the etymology of it bit by bit was really fascinating even for me and, and challenging at times. There were times I could say, I don't know why we say that, we just do. Um, you know, one of my favorites is uh, a phrase is, you know fine well, which makes no sense in English. But when someone says... Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. The other person would say, you know fine well. Um, and just breaking that into another language was was really challenging. And then when Glaswegian women go grocery shopping or they run errands or do their errands, the phrase is, you run the messages. And explaining this to a Thai translator, you know, messages, are they taking letters? No, no, no. Uh, are they running? And I'm like, no, the character's 75. I'm pretty sure she doesn't run many places. Um, but just breaking down all of that and making sure they understand was, was a fascinating experience. Even though I've been an American immigrant now for 20 years, I think of myself as Glaswegian. And so it's something that's you know, I think that's my core identity. And that's the language I think in when I'm not having to communicate. And so it was very easy to work with the dialect and the dialogue in that way. But I think something that helped me as well was having uh, immigrants experience. First, when I first came to America, I was incredibly broad with my Glaswegian and no one could understand me. And uh, as someone who, even in fashion and textiles, that's still a communications art. Um, when people can't understand you, when you can't express yourself clearly, there's no point in what you're saying if you're losing the audience. And so, in a way, it allowed me to write Shuggy from a very um, honest Glaswegian point of view, but then also to consider my husband. Could my husband read it? Could he understand what I was saying? You know, you I think sometimes if the language in Shuggy might lose you in a few places, you should still understand the thrust of the sentence or where we are going with that. And so I tried to balance both sides of that as a writer. The women cackled without breaking their concentration on the cards. It was sweaty and close in the front room. Agnes watched her mammy, little Lizzie, carefully studying her hand, flanked by the bulk of Nan Flanagan on one side and Rini Sweeney on the other. The women sat thigh to thigh and tore at the last scraps of a fish supper. They were moving coins and folding cards with greasy fingers. It bored Agnes. There was a time before baggy cardigans and skinny husbands that she had led them all up to the dancing. As girls, they had clung to one another like a string of pearls and sang at the top of their voices all the way down Sucky Hall Street. They had been underage, but Agnes, sure of herself even at 15, knew she would get them in. 
The doorman always saw her gleaming at the back of the line and beckoned her forward, and she pulled the other girls behind her like a chain gang. They held on to the belt of her coat and muttered protest, but Agnes just smiled her best smile for the doorman, the smile she kept for men, the same smile she hid from her mother. She had loved to show off her smile back then. She got her teeth from her daddy's side and the Campbell teeth had always been weak. They were a reason for humility in an otherwise handsome face. Her own adult teeth had come in small and crooked and even when they were new they had been, never been white because of the smoking and her mammy's strong tea. At 15 she had begged Lizzie to let her have them all taken out. The discomfort of the false teeth was nothing when compared to the movie star smile she thought they must give her. Each new tooth was broad and even and as straight as Elizabeth Taylor's. Agnes sucked at her porcelain. Now here they were, every Friday night, these same women playing cards in her mammy's front room. There was not a single drop of makeup between them. Nobody had much of a heart to sing anymore. I think there's so many writers that have had an influence on me. Uh, you know, I didn't really discover Scottish writing until I was in my 20s, until I was a man and I could search out reflections of myself, I suppose. But as soon as I start to devour James Kelman, Alexander Trockey's Young Adam, uh, Alan Warner, I, I just feel this sense of empowerment. Because here, first of all, is a celebration of my native language, but also very urgent, dignified, working class lives on the page. Um, one of my favorite writers uh, is actually Agnes Owens. She's a very lesser known Scottish writer. She's a contemporary of people like Alistair Gray and James Kelman. But she writes all that, uh, perhaps that violence and that roughness you would, uh, you would associate with Scottish literature, but she writes it with all the tenderness of a mother. She is herself a mother of five children. And the, just the combination of that, I think, is really powerful. So I love Agnes Owens. Uh, Janice Galloway has been really uh, inspirational to me. I, uh, she wrote a really fantastic book called The Trick is to Keep Breathing at the beginning of her career. And as a man, I actually think it's a book that a lot of men and especially a lot of male writers should read when they're thinking about writing female characters, because it's essentially just a story of a woman called Joy who is coming apart. Um, she suffered some tragedy in her life, but she is sinking and receding into herself. But Janice writes with such clarity to uh, mental health, to the female mind, I suppose, um, that it was just, it blew me away. Um, I absolutely love that book. Um, queer writers are incredibly important to me. Um, sometimes I find myself trying to write in the gaps that I find queer literature is left behind. As I said earlier, you know, Alan Hollinghurst is a huge inspiration, as is E.M. Forster, as are many queer writers. But I often find, especially in the 80s and 90s, that a lot of uh, queer points of view came from a very city centric, came from a middle class, someone who had mobility to him and to the narrative. And I think sometimes in working class communities, we don't hear enough from queer voices, from people who really feel sewn into that tight knit community, but also feel on the outside of it. And so I often, with my stories in The New Yorker and other places, I'm trying to just add to that tapestry, I suppose. Um, I think I'm, I th I think I feel I'm a, a liminal soul in lots of ways. Uh, am I Scottish? Am I American? Uh, I've had a fashion career. I've had a writing career. I was born, probably, I think working class is a stretch because we, it was probably, you know, working in the underclass perhaps. But now certainly I live in New York. And so I'm trying to embrace all those sides of myself or all those chapters of my life. One of the things that really benefited me was not necessarily that I attained a middle class education and I could write back about a working class milieu, but the distance was actually incredibly helpful. The distance gave me a lot of clarity to look back on the Glasgow of my childhood and think about it, but it also gave me an enormous sense of longing. Part of the reason why I could commit to a 10 year pro project was because I wanted to be with those characters. I wanted to recreate them, but also because I went out into the world and I realized uh, through the stoicism of Scottish people, through the fact that we erase queer voices in working class communities, from the fact that we don't give a voice to working class women, that a lot of people didn't understand this world. I didn't see representations of those years um, out in the wider world. And so almost moving and traveling away and seeing a bit of the world, let me know there was silence there um, and let me sort of answer it. The strangest thing experience for me was 
you know, I'm incredibly fortunate to come from Scotland who believes in an education even for the poorest kids. But the minute I had my first day at university, other university kids who perhaps mostly came from a middle class background just suddenly assume you're like them. It's you almost you're assimilated very quickly, which is also a very erasing thing. You can't then you have no one to share your own background for. And so you just swallow it. Um, and so really that sort of ascension to middle class or something gave me a desire, a drive to go back and excavate. 